Hello, I'm Dr. Maurice Dupre, and in this section we're going to discuss differentiation and integration of vector-valued functions. Let's look at a picture of what happens with differentiation of vector-valued functions. One way to picture what's going on is if I have a vector-valued function r of some variable, in this case I'll designate it t, uh, then I can think of that as what we call a position vector. That is, we fix the tail of the vector r of t at the origin, and so as t varies, the vector changes, but the tail won't move. In that way, the tip of the vector specifies a position in space. And so consequently, we're going to think of that r of t as a position vector. And so here, if the tip of the vector starts here, as the t changes, it traces out some curve in space. Notice if I think of the t as time, then we're actually getting a motion in space. It could speed up for parts of the curve and then slow down and speed up and so forth. And so the idea of differentiating the curve is to take the rate of change of that function. In the case where the, we're actually thinking in terms of motion, the derivative then would be the velocity of the motion. Now our picture here is showing the position vector at a given instant. Notice it's sort of coming out of the board, this red arrow outlined in blue-green is the position vector. So it's sort of coming out at us at that instant. And at that instant, this vector, the second red vector, r prime of t, is actually tangent to the curve, and that's the principal characteristic of the derivative, the, the way you should think of it. It is tangent to the curve at each value of the parameter t. So at the particular value of t, if I look at the tip of the position vector and place the derivative vector with its tail at that tip, it is a little tangent vector, might be very big actually, to the curve at that point. So that's the thing to keep in mind. R prime of t is tangent to the curve c, and the point of tangency, of course, is the tip of R of t. Now let's look how we calculate the derivative. Here in yellow, I have a curve which we'll think of as the tip of the moving vector, all the tails are fixed at the origin, and so here would be the position at time t, and then this vector would be the position at time t plus delta t. Think of it for just for purposes of, of having something definite here. Think of it as a later time, and we'll think of the parameter as time, so this is a motion. What is the change in position that took place over the interval from t to t plus delta t? Well, we denote that by delta r. Notice delta r connects the tip or the position at the earlier time to the tip at the later time. And also notice from this triangle of vectors, it's really saying in effect that delta r is r of t plus delta t minus r of t. So that, in effect, is the displacement along this curve that takes place from t to t plus delta t. And so to define the derivative of the vector-valued function, we just take the limit as delta t approaches 0 of the delta r divided by delta t, which is also denoted dr dt. So the notation, in effect, is the same as with ordinary differentiation. It's just that now we've got vectors involved. And so putting in what delta r is, then we see finally r prime of t is the limit as delta t approaches 0 of r of t plus delta t minus r of t over delta t. Now you might notice that everything here you know how to calculate and so consequently it can be done in particular component wise if we have the r of t expressed in terms of component functions of t and so consequently the limit as delta t approaches zero would be the same limits for each of the the component functions and would therefore give us the derivative of each of the component functions that is we calculate r prime of t component-wise.
if r of t is f of t comma g of t h of t an angle bracket so these are the components of the vector r of t then r prime of t is just given by f prime of t comma g prime of t comma h prime of t in angle brackets for instance if r of t is t squared comma e to the t comma t cubed in angle brackets what is r prime of t well you just differentiate each component derivative of t squared is 2t derivative of e to the t is e to the t derivative of t cubed is 3t squared so I don't think anything could be much simpler when it comes to actual calculation that is if you know how to differentiate in ordinary functions then you can easily differentiate vector valued functions in terms of their components well let's look at a problem of differentiating a vector valued function so for the vector valued function r of t equals 3 cosine t comma 3 sine t comma e to the negative t calculate r prime of t r at t equals 0 r prime at t equals 0 and sketch the curve as well as r at time t equals 0 and r prime at t equals 0 okay so here on the coordinate system I've got the function r of t equals 3 cosine t 3 sine t e to the negative t as components in order to imagine what the uh, curve looks like let's first concentrate on these first two components because we recognize cosine t and sine t and remember cosine squared plus sine squared is 1 so if I were to just be concentrating on the first two components that would obviously be a parametrization of a circle of radius 3 and so as a guideline I draw the circle of radius 3 in the xy plane now uh, because I see the z coordinate has e to the negative t in it so my position vector at parameter value t not only has the uh, horizontal component of a position on the circle but it has a vertical component given by e to the negative t so in effect if I think of t as time and this is a motion at time t equals zero we're at well as far as the circle is concerned at time t equals zero for three cosine t three sine t we'd be right here where the circle intersects the x-axis but at t equals zero e to the negative zero is just one and so that puts our position one unit above the circle and here I've drawn the blue green arrow showing our position at time t equals zero so in effect what we realize is that r at time zero is the vector with components three comma zero comma one see look cosine of zero is one three times one is three sine of zero is zero three times zero is zero e to the negative zero is one and so there's our position and that little blue green vector you see is sort of coming out at us its tip is one unit above the place where the circle of radius three intersects the x-axis now to differentiate the function we just differentiate component wise so r prime of t is well what's the derivative of cosine t that's negative sine so we have negative three sine of t comma derivative of sine is cosine so we have three cosine of t comma and the derivative of e to the negative t is negative e to the negative t and so there is our derivative as a function of the parameter t so what will we get now when I compute the derivative at time t equals zero well at time t equals zero the uh, sine of zero is zero so that component is zero at time t equals zero cosine zero is one times three is three and at time t equals zero e to the negative t will be 
e to the negative zero, which is one, but with this negative sign in front makes it a negative one. So there you see is r prime at t equals zero. Now, what we want to do is draw r prime of zero as well. So what are its components? The x component is zero, the y component is three, and the z component is negative one. So that means since the x component is zero, this vector is parallel to the blackboard, because remember we always draw our coordinate system so that y and z are in the plane of our paper or blackboard or whiteboard in this case. And so consequently, that vector is pointing in this direction. We see it's going over three units to the right and down one. So if I draw that vector with its tail right here at the tip of the position vector, it goes over three and down one. And so you see it's actually tangent to the yellow curve which I've specified here. In other words, our z coordinate e to the negative t, what happens? We're spiraling round and round and round, getting ever closer as t gets bigger and bigger, e to the negative t goes to zero, and so we're getting ever closer and closer to that circle of radius three. The entire motion, in effect, is taking place inside this cylinder, infinite cylinder of radius three, whose axis of symmetry is the z-axis. This spiral down on the circle of radius three at the instant where t equals zero then, we're just above the place where the circle crosses the x-axis one unit high, and our tangent vector is parallel to the yz plane. Okay, so that's how this calculation goes. Now suppose, for instance, I'm thinking of this as a motion, and I'm asked, well, what's the speed of this motion at the time t equals zero? Well, remember speed is simply the length of the velocity vector. So speed is the length of r prime at t. And so in this case, we could calculate the length of r prime of t squared, we just sum the squares of the components. Excuse me. We have three times negative sine t quantity squared plus three times cosine t quantity squared plus e to the negative t quantity squared. And so consequently, sine squared plus cosine squared is one, and so this ends up, the sum of these two squares is just nine. So r prime of t length squared is nine plus e to the negative two t, and so consequently, our speed length of r prime of t is square root of nine plus e to the negative two t. What's our speed at time zero? That's the length of r prime at t at t equals zero. If I put t equals zero here, I just get square root of nine plus e to the zero is one or square root 10. Uh, for instance, we know r prime of zero, remember, was the vector zero, three, comma, negative one. Square three, you get nine. Square negative one, you get one. The square root of nine plus one is square root 10. So that would be the speed at the instant t equals zero. If I'm thinking of that spiral down on the circle of radius three as being a motion in space. Well, now let's look at some differentiation rules for differentiating vector valued functions. They're sort of modifications of the ordinary differentiation rules. They come out pretty much the same way because remember, differentiation is really happening component-wise, but 
it's good to keep in mind that, for instance, basically, if I have a sum of terms, for instance, for f of t plus or minus g of t, the derivative is the corresponding sum or difference of terms of their derivatives. In other words, for a whole bunch of terms, you just differentiate term-wise. Likewise, we have product rules, but here's the difference between ordinary functions and vector value functions, because with vectors, we have three different products to deal with. We have multiplication of vectors by scalars, dot product of two vectors, and cross product of two vectors. So consequently, we can have a scalar function multiplying a vector function, giving us a new vector valued function. Its derivative is then f prime of t times the vector valued function g of t plus the scalar function f of t times the vector valued function g prime of t. Or if I have the dot product of f of t with g of t, to differentiate that, remember f of t dot g of t is now purely a scalar valued function. And so consequently, its derivative is a scalar function. But notice the same type of product rule applies. It's the derivative of the first factor dotted with the second factor plus first factor dotted with the derivative of the second factor. And then, of course, we have the cross product, sometimes called the vector product of two vectors, because it is a vector-valued product. That is, if f of t is a vector function and g of t is a vector function, then so is f of t cross g of t, and its derivative is a vector-valued function, is given by the derivative of the first factor cross with the second factor plus first factor cross with derivative of the second factor. When we go to forming functions with vectors, in fact, there are many ways. Here we've got three, but in general, there could, in fact, be many ways to form products. And you notice that in all these products, it's really kind of the ordinary product rule applies. Differentiate the first factor times the second plus first times derivative second by whatever multiplication rule you're using. And the main uh, thing that you have to ask yourself in any situation where you're dealing as, with a product is, does the distributive law hold? When the distributive law of multiplication holds, then this product rule for differentiation is going to work. Well, let's see how we can apply these rules in the case of uh, differentiating vector functions. Show that if r of t is a position on the sphere of radius r centered at p, then r prime of t is tangent to that sphere. So um, here I've drawn a picture. And because I want to emphasize the fact that this all happens with the, the differentiation rules involving the vector valued functions, I've suppressed the coordinate axes. All I want to do here is take a point for the origin. And here I've got a sphere. Imagine that sphere is sitting out in front of the plane of this board. And so at any time t, r of t is some point on that sphere. And so it comes out from the origin. Think of the origin as a point on my board. And so it comes at us and it, in this particular picture. It's coming through the back side of the sphere at that point, And now the arrowhead is, is inside the sphere and touches the surface of the sphere at this point right here, just a little bit above the equator in front of us. So in effect, remember to think of this geometrically. It's best to think of the vector function as a position function, which you get by fixing its tail at the origin. And so as the vector varies, the tip moves. And so that means r of t is the vector OQ, where Q is this point on the sphere, which that Q is varying as t varies, but it's restricted to stay on the sphere. Now the point P here is the center of the sphere. And so what we do is form the vector r sub 0, which will be the vector from the origin to the point P. So that would simply be here labeled r sub 0, the vector from the origin to the point P. And what we can notice is 
is that this vector from the center of the sphere to the position at parameter value t, that one is simply p q. And so since r of t and r sub zero have their position, their tails positioned at the origin, that means the vector p q is r of t minus r sub zero. And so what does it mean for p q to have, to always have its tip on the sphere? Well, it means that it has to have radius capital R because this is the sphere of radius capital R. So our radius here is capital R. And so that would be the same as saying length p q equals capital R. And squaring both sides of that equation tells us, well, we have length PQ squared is R squared. Now remember, length PQ squared is the same as PQ dotted with itself. And this is where we get to use our differentiation rules because now what I have is this vector which is vector PQ dotted with itself is R squared. So let's write that. R of T minus R naught dotted with itself is capital R squared. So what's going to happen when I differentiate both sides of this equation? Remember, the, the radius of the sphere is fixed, so when I differentiate the right side, I get zero. Now let's use our product rule for differentiating the left side. Differentiate the first factor, we get r prime of t, dotted with the second factor, r of t minus r naught. On the other hand, the second term here is the first factor times the derivative of the second factor. So that's r prime of t, excuse me, r of t minus r naught dotted with r prime of t. Well, this has to equal the derivative of the right side, which is the derivative of r squared, which is zero. But notice both these terms are actually the same. So what I have here is twice this first term. They're both the same because the order of the dot product doesn't matter. So consequently, because both these terms are really the same, it's saying that either one of those terms is equal to zero. In effect, r prime dotted with r of t minus r naught equals zero. Well, what is r of t minus r naught? Remember, that's pq right here in the picture. And what does it mean when the dot product of one vector with another is equal to zero? Remember, that means they're perpendicular. And so consequently, the, wherever this motion was going on the sphere, and of course it could be all over the place here, at the instant that it passes that point, the uh, derivative vector is perpendicular to this vector from the center of the sphere to the location where you are at that value of t. So you know, maybe it's going over here. It's perpendicular to the radial vector coming out from the center of the sphere, and we know that that means it's tangent to the sphere because to be tangent to a sphere at a given point means you're perpendicular to the, to the line from the center to that point on the sphere, and so that does it. In other words, the product rule for differentiating the dot product has told us something very geometrical about a motion that is constrained to a sphere, or any vector-valued function that is constrained to have its values on a sphere of a fixed radius about a fixed center. Well, we've discussed differentiation of vector-valued functions. Now let's discuss integration of vector-valued functions. So for the integration of vector-valued functions, again, it's done component-wise. If r of t has the component functions f of t, g of t, and h of t, 
then the antiderivative of r of t denoted the integral sign with r of t dt would be the indefinite integral of f of t comma indefinite integral of g of t comma indefinite, indefinite integral of h of t. Now one little tricky thing you have to keep in mind when you're doing this with vectors is when you're doing an indefinite integral remember there is a constant of integration but we have a tendency to just write a big capital C for that constant of integration and if I wrote C in the integration of this one and C in the integration of this one and C in the integration of that one I might think that all those stand for the same value in a specific instance but in fact they have to have the possibility of all being different in other words when you do an indefinite integral of a vector valued function you have a different constant of integration possibly for each of the components so it's best to use for instance C big capital C with a subscript 1 here and a big capital C with a subscript 2 here and a big capital C with a subscript 3 here whereas in the case of definite integration when I integrate from A to B the vector valued function that's just the corresponding definite integrals of the components so let's see how we can actually do this in a problem with these various constants of integration find a function r of t satisfying r of 0 is the vector with components 2 comma 3 comma 1 and r prime of t is e to the t times vector i plus t squared vector j plus cosine t vector k so what we want to do then is anti-differentiate r of r prime of t so r function r of t must be the first component take an antiderivative of that function e to the t well that's just e to the t plus some constant of integration but remember we're going to deal with three possibly different constants of integration so I'll put a subscript 1 on that plus what's the antiderivative of the second component that would be t cubed over 3 plus another constant of integration I'll subscript the capital C with a 2 times the j and then finally what's an antiderivative of cosine t well that's sine t and plus a third constant of integration so that's how this looks in effect we could notice that r of t is equal to e to the t i plus one third t cubed j plus sine of t k that is we have the simplest antiderivative of each term plus vector c1 i plus c2 j plus c3 k which is another vector so an alternate way to view the constant of integration when we integrate vector valued functions is there is some constant vector which is the constant of integration and of course a vector has three components okay so here's our condition that r at t equals zero is two comma three comma one so we write two comma three comma one is r of zero and now we just put zero in for our expression of involving t so e to the zero is one so we get one i or just i zero here gives us nothing sine of zero is nothing so we have i plus let's just write this as a vector c in effect c1i plus c2j plus c3k is some vector which I'll write capital C with an arrow over the top it's got three components and so notice what does that mean for um, the vector C this is what we're trying to find well just move this term to the other side now remember the vector I since it's 1 comma 0 comma 0 that would mean the vector C is simply 2 comma 3 comma 1 
minus 1 comma 0 comma 0. And so what does that make C? 2 minus 1 is 1. And 3 minus 0 is 3. And 1 minus 0 is 1. So this vector that we need to add on here is the vector 1 comma 3 comma 1. So that would mean C1 is 1, C2 is 3, C3 is 1. That is, I could finish this off by, well, let's just do it by eraser here for simplicity. Replace the first constant of integration by a 1. I'll replace the second constant of integration by a 2, excuse me, a 3. And the third constant of integration gets replaced by a 1. And so here, finally, then, is our function which satisfies these conditions. Namely, it has this derivative, and its value at t equals 0 is 2 comma 3 comma 1. We can check this. If I differentiate this, obviously, the derivative of the first term is e to the t. The derivative of the second term, t cubed over 3 plus 3, will be t squared. The derivative of the third term, sine t plus 1, is cosine t. And what about the value at 0? If I put, put 0 in for t, I get e to the 0, which is 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. Put 0 in for t here. That reduces to 3. Put 0 in for t here. Sine of 0 is 0, and it just reduces to 1. So we have exactly what we were looking for. Well, now that you've seen how we work these problems, you might want to try some on your own. The principal thing to remember is that the calculations are all done component-wise, but occasionally geometry can be useful, especially because of the differentiation rules that apply to the various vector products and dot products and so forth that you have for vectors.